Hi, everyone. Uh, we're going to get started in just a couple seconds. If you could take your seats. Thanks a lot. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Under the Bows. How many of you are under the bows for the first time? Hey, good. I've never seen you. I did. So let's make sure I <laughs> ask Suri what I should do. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So what we're out there that are driving change in. Look at the innovator. Enterprise of the camp. So uh, it's, it's, a, it's a partnership of Cambia Grove and BioEngage, and uh, we're, we're trying to understand, to the extent that we can, the chaos that is commonly known as the healthcare system. And as somebody points out, it's far from a system. It might be an industry, but I don't know what it is. So it's a delight today to consider a, an entirely new aspect of healthcare that we haven't really talked about, which is the patient. And what's going on with patients? Are there really patients? Should we call them consumers? How do we think about these people? And, and what is the, what's happening? What's driving the changes? And what do we foresee? So it's very uh, exciting to have with us Wendy Sue Swanson from uh, Seattle Children's. Other affiliations you can tell us about. You, you have a complicated portfolio. And uh, Connie Phelps from Wildflower, which is headquartered in San Francisco. And th these two women are at the frontier of dealing with, observing, and forecasting what's going on with patients in the world of healthcare. So welcome, you two. Thank you for being here. 
maybe before we talk about the substance of all this, tell us a little bit about your professional path. How did you get to this point? Connie? Can you hear me okay? Okay. I was hoping you would start, Dr. Swanson, so you, your, your, your professional past is very deep and wide, but um, I can give you a little background on, on how I came to be here today and what my past experience is. Um, I've worked in healthcare almost my whole career. Um, for a good deal of that time, I was with GE Healthcare. We actually have an office over on 4th and Madison that I frequented quite, quite, quite a lot uh, over the years. But um, my journey in healthcare as, uh, from the inside um, mostly with GE Healthcare, but um, during the dot-com boom that happened in the early to mid-90s, um, I jumped out <laughs> of healthcare, and I jumped into technology, and I had a front row seat in San Francisco to some pretty incredible um, sites and experiences. So that's, uh, that really started uh, my passion for technology, and I learned that I'm a much bigger geek than I ever thought I was on the technology side. Um, so that changed things forever for me and really set me on a path to pursue how to leverage what I knew about technology and how to leverage what I knew about healthcare to complement each other and how to solve problems with technology and healthcare. Um, so after that, I, I really got interested in mobile health for a number of reasons, a number of personal reasons, and uh, you know, just it's a very obvious, I think, path to help solve some problems in healthcare if everyone's in. Um, and I've worked on the mobile health side for a while, um, working for a company called Volt before that does mobile health solutions for inside hospitals and solves communication between uh, providers and caregivers. Uh, and now for almost the past year, I've worked for Wildflower Health in San Francisco and we're very uh, consumer focused. I don't know if we're gonna use that word or not, but we'll decide by the end of the night. Um, but we're very focused on engaging people before they become patients and, 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 and influencing their care and influencing their decisions and in fact raising the health literacy of the population at large just through uh, mobile whenever we can. So it's a, it's a, a, a big task at hand, um, but we've been doing it since 2012 and I've been a part of it for the past year and it's, uh, uh, it's really taken off. So I'm happy to be here, thank you. I'm happy to be here too, thanks. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're all patients. It makes it really easy and levels this playing field in the conversation. <laughs> and all of our personal experiences, I think, really drive us. Um, I was a patient, uh, had some serious experiences as a child, probably drove me. Then I was a teacher uh, in Oakland, California. Then I went to medical school and studied uh, bioethics. And it was that time that I really started to drill into the interesting space that, that I play in, which is ultimately what we used to call the doctor-patient relationship and what we now call the provider-patient or the patient-provider space or the care team-patient space. I do think of those, I believe that wellness is a part of healthcare. So I believe that if we're talking about wellness or we're talking about sickness, we're talking about the end user being a patient. So I don't like thinking about people as consumers, but I'm not, I don't think ignorant enough to think that we can't. <laughs> I think we have to think about the money and where it's moving and how, how we're moving things along. Um, I'm a general pediatrician. I spent the day um, with snotty, febrile, disgusting, gooey children, and I'm not kidding. Uh, my MA and I, I wore a mask with almost everybody, so I had just regular boots on the ground, run of the mill, 15-minute um, visits this morning with nervous parents worried about fevers and ear infections, rashes, autism. Um, behavioral problems, depression, anxiety. Um, but my other hats are really because that space is clearly not perfect and I don't feel I can fulfill the oaths that I really wanna fulfill um, in kind of the art of curation. So I'm the chief of digital innovation now at Seattle Children's, a role I've kind of made up as I've gone along. I founded Digital Health about three years ago and that was three years, three or four years after I started writing a blog. And the kind of mommy blogging space for me in the almost peer-to-peer, -peer, kind of borrowing from the peer-to-peer -peer healthcare movement of saying, if I can talk to parents who are ultimately the decision makers who benefit children as a mom and the tonality of mom, but with evidence and, and research and expertise in arm's reach, can I start to convert and change even how they acquire, seek, and gain information education and how they make decisions? So that turned into then using social media, which turned into meeting kind of technology companies. And then at Seattle Children's, our team in digital innovation, we have kind of um, reworked a couple of technologies for education sharing in the transplant space. So we now wed peer-to-peer -peer health education with expert education on iPads at bedside. We've reduced pharmacy bedtime teaching from in the six to 12 hours to one to two hours. We've built a new technology called Virtual Handshake, which ultimately takes hopefully diagnostic information and care providers matching and gives people a profile, education, and links before they come in, and then hopefully allows them to build community with people they love and um, care 
about their children and then get them information thereafter. And we're ultimately trying to think on how do we get people like you who care about healthcare, who have outside solutions, population-based solutions, um, and new ways of thinking about managing education, information, and communication at large in efficient ways into the health system like Seattle Children's. Because we're a research organization, we're a foundation, and we're a hospital system who delivers really high acuity tertiary care to a large kind of five-state mass. Um, but we're really loping and learning how to use and do things differently in the current structure, which is ultimately, unless you're in front of us, <laughs> unless we're doing um, procedural-based interventions, we're, we're not able to pay for the lights. And we take care of anybody at Seattle Children's. So our foundation and the generous gifts from donors allow us to serve a really large Medicaid population where we don't always kind of make ends meet. So um, I also work for King 5 News, so I do health reporting um, for the population that way, and I do a lot of um, advising and speaking to health systems around the country on where are we going to go and how is this going to work and how every solution that we talk about today I think has to be, of course, about patients and their families, the stakeholders in their lives who are often just as important as the individual patient. Um, but how are we also thinking about the care team? Because as we all know, burnout rates are extremely high. People are not that happy. And if I had to go see snotty toddlers and worried parents every 15 minutes, six days a week, like most of my pediatric colleagues, I wouldn't be very happy either. So it's thinking on what I like to call dual centricity, not just patient centeredness, but truly dual centric solutions that ultimately take everyone into account and make sure that you are checking boxes for everybody with every trial or pilot or tech you're building. So let, let's pick up on this a little bit because our struggle with vocabulary about what to call these people uh, maybe highlights some of the other points each of you have made, which is uh, we can, can we think about this as the recipients of health care, that is patients and their advocates and their, their, uh, their parents or what the, the, that collection of people out there? Uh, is it a mistake to think about these folks simply in terms of being recipients but rather than being proactive managers of their own health uh, what what do you call these people and how do you think of them it seems like maybe it's a little more variable than uh, most of us would assume and there perhaps is a danger uh, if, I, if I'm an innovator or anybody else of thinking about thinking too narrowly about these folks what's your experience well, I think they're really different. <laughs> we, we have similarities as human beings in suffering when it comes to healthcare. I mean, I think we go to the doctor when we're in pain or we go to the doctor when we're anxious about something. I mean, show me another reason why you go to the doctor. Um, I, I think they both actually all comes down in like a plinko. I see it as like a plinko and like in the end, it's one of those two reasons. So we're similar in that way, why we're drawn to healthcare because of desperation. But we're different in the sense of how active we want to be, how paternal, how much paternalism we like and how much we don't. You know, I think we all push aside paternalism saying it's wrong and bad. And yet there are times as a, as a patient myself where, I, where someone will say, well, what do you want to do? And I'll say like, that's why I'm here. It's to find out what you want to do. Right, so you know there is an art and a, and a way to say who are you as a person. You know, do we? You know, I love um, when when we I interfaced with some um, of the innovators at at Starbucks and talked with um, their head over digital there at one point. They were talking about kind of reforming the business at one point, and they said, you know, what when they asked their customers, and those are true customers buying coffee and um, and experiences, was that. Um, they were actually selling the start of a day, not selling a, a cup of coffee. Um, and that when they learned, what, what did they want? Well, they wanted to be known, right? You go into Starbucks, somebody looks at you in the eye, they write your name on the cup, they ask you if you like your product. If the product's not good, they say they're gonna make it better for you. Imagine if you felt known when you were well and you felt known when you were ill in this, like the non-existent system. So I think, um, I think we're all the same that way, that we want to be known, <laughs> we want to be cared for, we don't want a lot of healthcare because nobody wants to be sick, and yet we, want, we go in for it because we want to be reassured because we're anxious, right? And the world is telling us to be anxious because they're pushing us all sorts of content, and Dr. Oz has a show every single day where he's gonna tell you that something's wrong and you should buy a vitamin for it, right? <laughs> So, um, so I think we're the same, but then I think, of course, we're very different because of how we prefer to communicate who's at our back and who's at our side, and, and ultimately, we are exceedingly biased based on our experiences, from wellness to illness to being treated poorly in a health system to being treated really well. And so, um, 
I don't think we, we, we can segment this population of the kind of kale eating, plank doing, granola people, non-interventionalists who actually make horrible decisions and sometimes don't vaccinate their kids to those who are um, run of the mill, I'm gonna do whatever you say, doctor, paternalism, and I'm gonna trust this. Um, but, but to our point that we were talking about ahead of time, I think we're reforming right now the system being based on experience in a good way. We're starting to say patient satisfaction scores matter. We're gonna judiciously look at them. University of Utah under Vivian Lee's leadership has made patient satisfaction scores entirely transparent in real time. You can take, you can fill out a Prescani at University of Utah and it shows up on the website the next day. So if you're gonna go see Dr. If you're gonna go see Dr. Swanson at University of Utah tomorrow, you can go see how she's been performing in live time, which is kind of, you know, which is amazing. But there's an illusion that you're getting great quality health care when you're getting great quality service. And that's really tricky and really hard to serve to let patients find each other and learn about experiences and go to the doctor that everybody loves. But sometimes they might be going to the doctor that everybody loves who isn't actually providing the highest quality care. And that's where the pr profound benefit of large academic health systems come in, where we say we're going to do randomized controlled trials and we're going to watch quality judiciously and very carefully and we're going to study what works and what doesn't. But you've got all the concierge models and you've got peer-to-peer -peer healthcare, which is relevant and important. And then you've got people quantifying how they move and how they eat and how they work and, and we're soon going to have, and we have capsules that can go through our body and look at our entire GI tract. I mean, sooner or later, you're not gonna need some bozo like me who works for a big health system because you're gonna be able to outsource it and organize it yourself if you're that kind of upstart person. So I'm gonna stop. But th I think those segments are really like, there are all these different players and all these different important people and the, and the startup companies that are saying, we're gonna help you connect and run this yourself and get what you need and give you information on what the best way forward is are really important for keeping us all in check. Yeah, it's. Um, I think you're echoing some of the experiences that we've had, and just to just to take it back a step and and uh, and share my own perspective. When I joined Wildflower Health last year, and my CEO Leah Sparks used the the term consumer a lot. To me, ha coming from a patient centric world inside the hospitals and in healthcare, that that didn't sound right to me. It didn't feel right to me. Uh, and yet, I have to say, now that I'm you know uh, almost a year into the company. Um, I get it. I understand it. And I think, I think the, the thing is, and j just a little bit on your, your point to Dr. Swanson is, um, you know, and I, I actually heard a, a recent um, lecture by the chief experience officer at Cleveland Clinic where she uh, called this person engagement not consumer, not patient engagement, but person engagement, just acknowledging that we do need to reach these people before they become patients and help them become patients and help them make better decisions. And there's only so much we can do. We can't, you know, we can't solve diabetes, we can't solve behavioral health, we can't solve cardiology and, and all these other segments all at once, but we have to do the best we can and we have to start down the path and try to help with uh, with cost as we, you know, obviously trend toward value-based care. Um, but, but the important thing is catch the consumer's attention early, get the consumer engaged in their own health care. Sometimes that takes an event, a compelling event, like a pregnancy, having a, a new child, maybe having an orthopedic surgery or cardiology, uh, interventional cardiology event. So something like that can get someone into the healthcare su uh, system. Um, but, you know, it's important to make sure that, that you create those relationships while they're still consumers so that you can help guide their decisions and help, help keep them loyal to your, either you as a provider or you as a hospital or, uh, or what have you. Just help keep them loyal and keep them engaged so that you can keep track of them long term. So I think that's pretty important. Yeah, yeah. Um, so um, the question was, can can I talk a little bit about what we build? So, um, I, I what we have at Wildflower Health is a is a cloud based engagement platform. So that engagement platform initially a few years ago when we started the company in 2012 was very focused on women and women's health and specifically maternity. And that's how we got started. And it was for very personal reasons for the co-founders of the company, including our current CEO, Leah. Um, so that's why the company started. We created the solution to really guide women through their pregnancy because she had a pregnancy where she's pretty tech savvy um, and she was searching for some guidance and some help on her mobile device with her pregnancy and she wasn't finding the right kind of engagement or the right kind of, kind of guidance. So that's why she started down the path. Now, flash forward to 2017, what we've seen is that that experience that we have creating that journey with pregnancy applies to so many other areas of healthcare, including pediatrics, including cardiology, including uh, behavioral health potentially. So what we have to do is look at the opportunity in the market as we switch to value-based care and figure out 
You know, how, can we address this $230 billion cardiology market, the $110 billion uh, you know, maternity market, and can we guide these people through their journeys and get them engaged in their care in a lasting way? And one of, one of the things we're finding as we, as we move forward is there's a, there's a big tie from maternity to pediatrics, obviously, with conversion you know, for those patients. Once you, once you have the child, we need to continue care and keep that person in the system and, and keep all that tracking on track with one one single uh, engagement platform. So that's what, we're, that's what we have, and I, I hope that was clear, but basically it's a hosted solution, it's a multi-tenant solution, so we can have various hospitals, various health plans, which we also have, and even employers. We have employers like Apple and uh, IBM who, who use our solution with their employees. So basically a cloud-based solution that to the consumer or the patient um, looks like an app. So I would wager that the innovators in the audience have the adoption curve going through their head at this point. Um, because you've just said that we've got everybody from uh, the hyper-engaged, mobile-savvy, uh, highly motivated and, and responsible types to those who just want to be paternalistic. And oh, by the way, my behavior in that regard changes depending on my diagnosis, right? Uh, uh, and so, from an innovator's perspective, you've got to say, well, how real is this? How fast is it going to change, et cetera? But I would think that the providers in the audience would be saying, how on earth am I going to uh, get into this new world of provider-patient um, interaction with all that variability? In, in terms of what the patients want and how they behave. So what's actually going on out there? How are providers responding to this new climate that you're describing? Uh, and uh, and how, do they, how are they dealing with the, not, well, the, the legacy of all, all the traditional ways of not dealing with it and with the um, heterogeneity of, of their patients? What are providers doing? Well, I mean, <laughs> providers are doing what they've always done, right, which is um, kind of stand on their feet in their knowledge of what they need to get done when they walk in the door of the exam room, and then accommodating based on who they think, how much they know about that person that's there, and adjusting to that, right? Adjusting the cadence of speech, adjusting the way that you educate based <clears throat> potentially on how you experience a family's level of understanding or where they're coming about that problem, et cetera. But I think ultimately providers are, are overwhelmed and desperate for better ways to do it, right? That they can get on an airplane and order some diapers or click one click away and order green kale juice to arrive at their door by seven in the morning, set themselves an alarm, have Siri respond and dictate a note home, and then realize that to get a doctor's appointment, they have to call on a phone like I did yesterday, wait for someone at Harborview to call me back today, make an appointment that's a month out, right? M then call someone else and then go there, check in. Um, actually, today I was told, well, you haven't been seen by this surgeon for this amount of time, and it, you should call Regents to find out if you need a referral, because I don't know if you do. So now I just made an appointment. I have to wait for it. I had to call on the phone. I had to wait for a day to make that appointment. And now I, ha I have to call the back of my insurance card at Regents to find out then if I have to go bug my primary care doctor to send a referral so that I don't get dung for this surgical visit. That happened today to me as an informed consumer. And I yesterday ordered kale juice to arrive at my door on the airplane and it arrived at my door at seven in the morning, right? So there's that incredible mismatch of saying, and then I went to clinic and saw like 17 snotty kids, right? In a regular way, in the way that like everything that is, and I wrote prescriptions through an electronic health record and I copied these little things and I sent it down, right? So, so I think we're extremely frustrated that the tools just don't work that way. The electronic health record has not been designed, nor is it currently being modified, or is it motivated to be modified to make my experience more like going and buying stuff at Amazon or going on my phone and pre-ordering my coffee so that I, when I walk by at the hospital, I can pick it up on the way to a meeting. Right? No one's designing it that way because what in the electronic health record has done is said, we're going to make sure that I documented what I saw with these snotty kids today. And I mean snotty in the snotty way. They were not snotty to me. They were very nice. Um, and, the, and like I'm documenting that in the electronic health record and I'm making sure that I've documented enough so that I can put a 99214 and an ICD-10 code attached to it and my clinic will get paid. 
And, 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 we're, and we feel the pressure to make sure we're seeing a lot, to the point that my MA said to me today, you know, when you're here for five hours, we just have to make sure that you see at least eight people. And we, my, my medical assistant today said, if you just see eight people, we break even. And I was like, what? <laughs> and I, I mean, my medical assistant said that, right? So there's these pressures of like, see, 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 do, do, do. And then make sure that your receptionist is really nice to them and the MA did everything they're supposed to do and the patient got all their questions answered so that they fill out their patient satisfaction score that they're really happy and then make sure that you document an electronic health record, make sure you match the ICD-10 code appropriately, do and fill out an after-visit summary, make sure you print it so you get qualified for meaningful use and then make sure you keep in touch with your MA who just said, Dr. Swanson, make sure you see more because if we don't see this many, you're not gonna get paid. So I think we feel really overwhelmed that the tools don't work. <laughs> but that happened today, right? Like, and as a consumer of healthcare and as a provider of healthcare, I was like, this is absurd, right? So, so I think, um, you know, as we, as, as we define these things more and more, as we've piloted, like my, you know, a couple of folks of my team are here, and as we've piloted these new little builds that we've made where we're trying to be patient-centered, where we're trying to bring, you know, we're also using a um, disease-specific community, peer-to-peer -peer healthcare, where we're not even going in, we're just introducing it to patients and families right now at Children's. And as we go in and we say, we wanna connect this patient with a smart patient who, who's been down that road before. And as I say, you know, I, I wanna get, um, I, I built this little tool, virtual handshake, and I, I think it's a, a great idea. I mean, I, it's my idea, so I'm like, patting myself on the back, but I, I think getting education to people before they come in, before they incur this, is priming them for a good visit, letting the surgeon that they're gonna see say, I want everybody who comes in with an inguinal hernia, presumed inguinal hernia, to read this stuff before they come in, because gosh, we'll start in a different spot, and they can watch this little video of me, and if they do a little video where I say why I come to work, maybe you'll trust me and like me and realize I care about you, and that's why I left home to be with you, so we can broker something better. But in the end, if it's not integrated into electronic health record, and if it's not easy for the doctors or the nurses or the MAs or the phlebotomists who are at bedside caring for people, because the MA is now whispering in that person's ear that they gotta see two more people today to keep the numbers up for the clinic, because at the staff meeting they're gonna bring it up. If we're not keeping it happy and fast and quick and it's not at the end game integrated, it's not gonna work. And that's so depressing because the EHRs are clunky and ugly and proprietary and hard to get into. And I know everyone's been complaining about it for a freaking decade, but the reality is like we gotta, we gotta muscle up and get a lot of integration specialists around so that anytime we do something, not because, not because the future is hospitals, because the future should not be hospitals, but to get new stuff in right now, you gotta have an early roadmap for integration, I think, if you're gonna be working in a health system. So when I was asking what's going on with providers, I was thinking both of the actual um, care team, but also the provider organizations. Connie, what are you seeing in terms of provider organizations' response to the kind of stuff Wildflower does or other such innovations? Because I think you know, what I see is two things. One, I absolutely see what you're talking about, Dr. Swanson. I, I honestly can't, can't imagine how you handle all that as a provider. Um, but uh, the, the most common thing I hear is don't mess with the physician's workflow. Don't impact it, don't take them off track, don't give them something extra to do. Um, at the same time, we wanna be sure that we prepare patients to have an effective visit. So you get seven, 10 minutes, 15 maybe if you're lucky. Um, how can that visit be super effective? So we can help with that. We can help prepare things. Um, we can help make sure they bring their x-rays if they have them and not have you wait for an hour to upload them. So we can do things like that to help pave the way. And you know, we're not, uh, we're not trying to be what an EHR is today. We're not trying to be a place for that data or a place for that stuff necessarily. But what we're trying to do is guide the patient or consumer or person through their healthcare. So give them tips and give them very personalized guidance through their healthcare episode, whether that's just tracking their family health, uh, tracking their two-year-old and their five-year-old, or whether that's going through a journey like an orthopedic surgery or a cardiology event. It's making sure that we, we guide them through that journey. And along the way, we collect information that can hel help their primary caregiver as well. Um, so from my perspective, I think the individual physicians that we talk to feel you know, overwhelmed, um, which is you know what I'm hearing from you as well. Overwhelmed by all the things on on their plate, and overwhelmed by all the solutions. And, and while, while I hear from uh, physicians that, that they would like to have a solution like this, you know, there's confusion about what 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 do we have, what is effective, um, and what we have to make sure we provide is not just. An, an addition to their workflow, but something that, that complements their workflow well, and also guides the patient through their healthcare and informs them. So it has to be both. I think hospitals are, um, you know, the, the two things they're starting to consider is one, 
um, innovation to help drive that, you know, the, the value-based healthcare initiatives that are happening now. How can, uh, how can we make sure that once a patient is discharged, they don't come back? How can we make sure that we actually uh, meet the objectives we're supposed to meet on that end? So hospitals are really starting to go down that path, which is one of, one of my objectives at Wildflower. Um, and we're working on that piece. The other piece is, you know, when, when I talk about consumers, um, you know, consumers, and I'm certainly one of them in the Bay Area, I always look for a digital footprint uh, for any, anything I do, anything I have, I look for a mobile app first. Uh, I'm a huge fan of Echo. I, I have my entire house voice enabled, uh, much to my parents' dismay when they come and visit me. Um, but uh, So I, I, I'm all in for, for, for all of that. But one of the things that we can do is help provide uh, you know, a, an immediate digital footprint for hospitals to help lead consumers to that hospital if they need care and make sure they go to the right place. Do they go, you know, for example, we're working uh, with Dignity Health in, in one of their markets and they have one high hospital that does high risk uh, deliveries and the other two don't. Let's make sure we get them to the right place. Can I just echo the, the echo the echo? The um, you know we have a couple of Amazon Echoes now in our house, and my kids play with it, and I learn so much from them because of the questions they ask and how useful she is. Um, but imagine if we aligned incentives. So I was thinking about my my sister in law is a pediatrician. Don't tweet this, and um, she she complains like she's just, she she doesn't have a nurse triage for their phone calls in line. They're in a private practice. She's not in the state. She's on the other side of the country. <laughs> But um, she really complains about the mommy calls at night. And the mommy calls, because she's like, you know, in her like late 40s, 50s now, and she's been taking mommy calls for 20 years, which the mommy calls are like, it's 3 in the morning, and they're calling you about the dose of Tylenol because the FDA doesn't let us put the dose of Tylenol for kids under 2 on the bottle. That's real, which is actually working at that systematically another way. But it's like, so you get this mommy call. But imagine if we really said to providers, we're just going to deploy the Echo Dot to every family, and, and, and you get your app, which Children's Boston is actually developing right now, an app like this on education base, and then the mom could say, Alexa, what's the dose of Tylenol for my 22-pound baby? Or it was smart enough to follow and track and integrate information from the health clinic, where she could say, what's the dose for Tylenol for Finn? Right? And then the next question could be, like, my kids had loose stools for three days. Do I need to see the pediatrician? Right? You could build algorithm after algorithm after algorithm based on kind of, you know, th th these are norms and these are bells, but most medical problems come under the bell, right? And I think that frictionless, that would make providers and payers really happy. Because, for example, my clinic, the Everett Clinic, we pay children's nurses in the middle of the night to take the first call so that we don't have the mommy call, so our doctors aren't so angry and upset about it. But then I gotta pay the lovely nurse who's sitting doing triage, answering the mommy call about Tylenol or using Tylenol or not, whatever. So, so I think the future is so bright <laughs> for thinking about most of healthcare and primary and wellness and wellness preservation and triage type questions to get people out of expensive emergency rooms and urgent facilities, get them to their primary care doctors, is gonna be met in ways by really saying and acknowledging that we all feel like individuals. We, like Virtual Handshake was designed to look very personal, and it's not. It says, hi, Wendy Sue. We're looking forward to seeing you and Finn next Tuesday at 3.30 for the diagnosis of inguinal hernia. You're going to be seeing Dr. Robert Sowen. Here's a video of why he comes to work, and here are four links. It just got plugged in from Epic, five little data entry points. But I said, here's your name. Here's your child's name. Here's why you're coming. Here's what we care about, right? So, and, and the bell of that is what the, the doctors are kind of like three things happen when kids come in with an inguinal hernia, right? We kind of know and can predict. So we can build a best case scenario for triage, for mommy calls, for information, for wellness monitoring. I mean, you could just say, gosh, my kid's six and a half today. What should I know and be reminded of? Well, the number one killer of kids at six is actually car accidents. Is your kid four foot nine? If they're not yet four foot nine, they still better be in a booster. Why are you paying me $180? to talk to people about diaper cream and rear-facing car seats between the age of one and two with my Ivy League medical degree. I still do it, it's still really important, but it, it doesn't need to happen from me by my voice in the clinical environment. So we can outsource and get rid of that rubbish so that when parents come in and they're actually really worried about the mole or they're worried about the lump under the jaw or they're really just worried that their grandmother had breast cancer and they really wonder that they might need to get BRCA1 testing and if they really wanna know, what they're really asking is, is my daughter gonna have breast cancer? So let, let, let's add one other perspective to this, because you guys uh, are raising some really good points here. Uh, Connie, a couple of th things you said uh, triggered the following thought. Healthcare is not what it needs to be in terms of its fractured nature, its difficulty of dealing with it, and its incompleteness, and, and all that stuff. 
But it's also got a huge problem is that it costs too bloody much. And hence, the other thing that's going on out there is this gigantic pressure to reinvent how we pay for health care. We don't know how it's going to come out, but the, about, about half of the health care world is bent on substantially modifying, if not eliminating, fee-for-service and moving more toward a capitated systems or some kind of value engineering. So there's, there's this financial pressure. Now, in the middle of that, a, a lot of people hypothesize that the patients, in their role as consumers, in a, a futuristic state of price transparency, are somehow going to be decision makers about what actually transpires and whether I buy it from <laughs> provider A or provider B. And there, there's this, the, the word consumer is in some sense projected into this future into which patients are making buying decisions. Uh, and, and that figures into this massive pressure for movement toward value. Really? Do you see any signs of it? Uh, uh, how, how do you, what, if we move away from fee-for-service and, and toward a value-based system, how is it going to affect this interface between the provider and the patient? Well, I think, <clears throat> I mean, from a cost perspective, you know, there is, um, you know, your average consumer just does, doesn't understand that piece of it, but yet they know their deductible is high and, you know, there's a lot of out-of-pocket and that's where the transparency comes in. But what we see moreover from a consumer level and from a, you know, from a, I think, current state level uh, is it's, there's always someone making health care decisions in your home. And we, we call it, some of our uh, clients call it the chief health officer of the home. There's always someone making those decisions. So in every industry, you know, for example, uh, you know, with, for a family of five, the, the mother or whoever the chief health officer of the, the home is might choose the family car, might choose the, uh, you know, the family, uh, you know, cable provider or what have you, might make those decisions. And they have even more of an influence on the healthcare side. So that mom or dad or whoever that chief health officer of the home is, is going to make that decision, is going to do that research, is going to choose the care for themselves and their family. It's always, there's always a, another team member or a partner or someone involved. So it's really important from our perspective that we serve the needs of that person. So we, we need to make sure that um, we provide an overview for the entire family, for example. We need to make sure that we provide that daily guidance, not just a place to find information, but uh, but those reminders every day throughout their health care. And we also need to make our content shareable, for, shareable for your partner and your family, shareable for a caregiver, as I have been in my family on, on several occasions. Um, I have often, you know, I've been in my family lives 2,000 miles away. Um, I just, I can't see what's going on when, when trouble happens or when I need to be engaged with my mom's care or, or what have you. So um, it's really important for us to make sure that we make our content and make sure that we make what we're making appeal to that chief health officer of the home and make sure that they see it and know about it and get engaged early. When you were talking about the Amazon Echo, and I'm, I'm very familiar with the kids in D app from Boston Children's Hospital. I'm enough of a nerd that I downloaded it, I, even though I don't have children. Um, I downloaded it to my Echo and, <laughs> and, and asked it to, to, uh, you know, to look up some fevers and so forth. So, um, you know, the, the, the thing is, here's a great service. And I've learned from watching people in my own family with, with many children. My brother has, uh, you know, five children. I've learned from watching them that, you know, the voice activation, there's something to that, right? Even with your, your arms full of children and bottles and so forth, it's nice just to be able to voice activate some things. But as far as, you know, help for docent and fever, how do consumers find that? How do consumers find that? So that, that, it's things like that that we're trying to help with. So when consumers at any of our hospital clients or with some of our, uh, you know, we work with uh, payers like, Cigna and United and so forth. Um, when any of those consumers are searching for help, we'd like to drive them to resources like that because otherwise, how are they going to find them? So that that's hopefully our role. But so. Well, I was just to say, you know, I, I think some people are going to be really happy happy with the shift to value based reimbursement as opposed to. I mean, they're just you know there are just these patient profiles. Like every doctor knows this. I mean, maybe all of you know it too. But there are just some families that come in a lot. And sometimes those families don't have any co-pays, and you know it. I mean, and they come in a lot. 
I mean, that it, it used to be kind of like the weight of a chart. You kind of knew either it was a sick, complicated child or a really anxious, worried mom. It's kind of one of the two when you got a really big, thick chart. Now it's electronic, so you can't get the thick, but you can kind of look. And like when I went in today, and you know, I, I, I saw more than the eight today. I saw, <laughs> I saw like I think 16 or something. And, it, and when I went in, with I scanned the chart ahead of time. And it's like I remember saying to one family, I said, well, tell me what made you, you're like, why did you call today? Because you guys don't ever come in. Right? You're really worried about something. Like I'd seen, the kid hadn't been seen for two years. So some people will be really happy with less contact, less care, um, less consumption. And then I think people will ultimately, there will be these segments again where people will like take what they get. I mean, kind of like Kaiser's led the way in that in some ways where you know, people went through where they couldn't really choose. I remember when my sister-in-law, a different sister-in-law um, in Colorado was in, was in Kaiser long, long ago when she had her kids who are now teenagers. And she was so irritated that she couldn't see the same pediatrician one after another, right? Because the huge and rich, precious commodity in parts of healthcare is the relationship, the trust that like you put in your pediatrician or you put in your oncologist or you put in your surgeon. It's the human being. There's a human factor to it, right? And there's a bond and an intimacy into it. And some people will take less of that if they still have it. And then I think other people will augment it. They'll download or pay for the B to C consumer thing that organizes. They'll buy an Echo and download and hack, if, they, if it's not pre-installed, a solution that's good for kids. And, and I think, um, and then they'll just be kicking and screaming as we figure it out of how are people getting enough and how are we making sure people don't fall through it. But I, I just think, again, there's just going to be these big segments that um, value-based care makes so much sense at large. But for me, I think about in the communication space and forecasting of how will we preserve the love affair the love affair that exists between a patient and a doctor they trust. And I think that's not because the, I believe so much in the paternity that the doctor knows all, like quite, quite the opposite. In fact, I think many of, of the things I've learned in the startup and entrepreneur space is really based in peer-to-peer -peer healthcare and that value that the patients themselves are probably the biggest untapped resource in the health space. But when everything hits it, the person that gets you where you need to go are the clinicians that you entrust and have a relationship with. And it's kind of like, can we continue to build intimacy digitally? Can you know me as your pediatrician because of my blog and my s Twitter channel and the little hits that I do? And what if I did send you a personal, I mean, one of the companies I want to build, I, I mean, I do this, I ruin all these things I share, but I don't ruin them. If anyone wants to build this with me, let me know. But I, I mean, like, why isn't there a tool that lets everyone else be kind of like what my mama doc is? That is, why isn't it that to manage a population we don't have this great tool that at the end of the week, it's like drag and drop. This is what Oz said. Tell people what you think about it. Click here, record a 30 second video. Click here. Oh, they have an ICD-10 code of oh, overweight and obesity. Did you, did you learn about this? There's a new park opening up. Or, oh, there's a new virtual reality gym and arcade for kids in Seattle. Drag and drop that here. And like, why on Fridays are you not getting a note from your doctor that includes like what happened this week and a reminder of what you should be doing based on maybe what your profile is that the EHR could really push to that, right? So I don't know. I mean. Well, let's, let's talk about that a little bit more. What sorts of innovations are you seeing? I mean, based on what you just said, I'm not soon going to see an innovation which is a link off of Kayak, uh, treating all pediatricians as the same. And it's going to come up with a, a list in the same way with airlines. I can find out not only price but number of stops and schedule. It's not going to come up that way. I can have Dr. Swanson in two months for $180 or Dr. Jones in six weeks for you don't know what I cost, though, right? That's the right. problem. Providers well, have no so, freaking clue. I mean, I know what a, ni a 992 is. But the fact is, I'm not going to be able to punch into Kayak that I need a pediatrician for my kid, and it's going to give me six options. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, that isn't going to happen anytime soon. But what kind of innovations are we seeing that actually affect patient thinking or uh, family health officer uh, uh, decision-making? What, what innovations are happening? Well, I, I have to say the thing that's making the most impact from my perspective is less of uh, I, I should say it's a digital innovation, but because I, you know, I think we're, we're innovating digitally, but I would say it's more about collapsing the silos of, of, uh, of care on the back end to make, make the experience of the consumer or the patient or the person seamless. So to help them make decisions, and I'll give you an example. Um, one of, the, one, one of our clients is Apple in Cupertino, and we, they have actually deployed our pregnancy app, which, um, which is called Due Date Plus, for their employees. So their employees go to the iTunes store, their own, their own personal iTunes, iTunes store, not the one that you and I use. Um, but their employees will go download the app. And from that app, we actually can 
uh, can display to them their benefits through United Health, for example. We can, di we can display to them their employee uh, benefits site. We can help them, uh, direct them to, um, to wellness sites, direct them to people who are uh, facilitating the Care for Apple employees. So all those things that they would have to go to separate websites for in real life, we can consolidate that access and actually put it in one app. So to the consumer, they've got one, they've got essentially a portal on their mobile device to everything that Apple offers. So the innovation for me is really making sure that whatever solution we deliver, we're very thoughtful about including, it, it's, it's just not gonna succeed without provider support. It's not gonna succeed without more than just uh, you know, providing access to care, you know, providing information for your local hospital. It, it has to have all of those things. So we have to have um, the, you know, the, the information on the benefits that the, the, that the patient has. We have to have where to get care that, that the patient can get. And we have to help guide them through that on a daily level. So for me, the innovation is figuring out a way to put that together that is, that is thoughtful. Um, and in the background, we have all these transparency, these, these marches toward, toward transparency, and there are a number of ways we can address that and connect to, to, to things to address that. But I think it's really, uh, it's really a behavioral change on our side and making sure that we're making it as easy for the people who have to navigate this care system as possible. You know, I think the other thing that people have <clears throat> is Facebook. And like at first glance, it sounds really dopey, but you know, there's like 1.6 billion people using it. Um, but what we have that we didn't used to have in healthcare is each other. And that means you can get in your Facebook group on Clubfoot and you can learn that the prosthetic that you just got prescribed is one third the cost if you buy it a different way than the system actually told you to do it. Um, you can find out and vet who your doctor is through all the different ways that we can do that online. Um, and, 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 and not to dope this down, but, but ultimately these, um, these patients like me, cure together, um, smart patients, um, care hubs, you know, all these different social networking, community building, peer-to-peer -peer sites are just revolutionizing how we make decisions. So we have each other because we can talk to Cousin Judy on Facebook too. I can, I, we have 23 and Me where I can find lost relatives, maybe even get an understanding that I might be learning, right, that I'm predisposed to be more hyper-quaggable in, in a different situation. But I mean, we're just starting to find each other, people who are like us, people who are related to us. Um, and we can then get to the information that we couldn't get. And I think profoundly that's changing it. And people feel guilty every day I'm in clinic. People say, I'm so sorry I looked it up, or I saw this on the internet, right? There's still this, like, I'm not supposed to do that. And, and they are doing that. And people are coaching them systematically like you are. But the world wants to help. You go crowdsource any question you want on Facebook, and it's not going to sit there unanswered. If you say, I broke my toe 14 times, what's wrong? And you put a picture up, somebody's going to say something. They may not be right. But I mean, we, we, so, you know, I mean, I think the Pew data, this is 2013 data, but ultimately that, you know, a third of Americans go online and self-diagnose. If you're college educated, 55% of people go online and self-diagnose. And 40% of the time, you're right. Like, you're not doing such a bad, four out of 10 without a medical degree is pretty stinking good. And that's 2013 data. Like, I think it's better now, right? And if you can get them to the, you know, Kids MD app, and you can get them the right resource on healthychildren.org, which I look at this in Pete's event, you know, that's the, the American Academy's website, and, and I can curate the right information for somebody. We've got each other, we've got education, I've got data, and I've got an idea. The partnership that Mayo Clinic made, I mean, Genius Mayo Clinic in 1995 launched mayoclinic.com. They were the first ones in the game, and they built a brand. And then they've built the number one US, world, you know, US News and World ranking hospital in, in this country. And it's partly based on brand, and they, they have the game of content online. You all know that. You Google anything, and you're going to get a Mayo Clinic at the top. But then they made the partnership with Google, right, based on big data. And they said, OK, well, let's aggregate the top 1,000 searches, and let's make these beautiful, informative, right side you know, browser base where you get epidemiology, you get treatment information, you get demographics, you get education, you get pictures, you get instructions. I mean. Dr. Google does a stinking good job. And there's nothing wrong with that. So, but we're still changing. That's still, that's changing right now because of people coming in and saying like, I'm so sorry I Googled it. And I'm thinking, great. And then if I'm humble enough as a provider, which most of us aren't, because we're all like competitive ego maniacs, because um, doctors are, 
and um, if I could say, well, what did you learn? And if I'm humble enough to say, well, teach me something and let's Google it together so I can see what you looked at. That's what's hard. It's like nobody knows where their breadcrumb was. They don't know who taught them. And we want people like Wildfire. And I think we, I, I went to Mama Doc and wrote this blog nine years ago or whatever because I wanted to start saying we can put good content on the internet um, and we want to get people the right stuff. But I think um, the bottom is like what people are doing is they're connecting with each other and with information and education. And they're getting virtual options, they're getting education and data, they're getting crowdsourcing on Facebook, um, and then they're coming in. So they're doing a lot more before the clinical encounter. So let's talk about the impact of this kind of thing on the way provider organizations think and, and, the, and, the, and the potential power to actually drive change. You know, those of us coming from the innovator space tend to think, well, the way to drive change in healthcare is to empower the consumer, give them good tools and let them drive uh, transformation, right? Well, really, <laughs> really, uh, is, is is that uh, do you do you do you see or do you predict uh, changes of provider organization behavior based on on these early adopter patterns that you're seeing among patients? Uh, I can share with you some experience we have that might um, might relate to that a little bit, but you know I, I guess I'll, I'll summarize by saying um, we we can't be successful without support from providers. And we know that, and I think in the past, over the past few years, we've seen like Google Health and Microsoft Health Vault and other companies like that that while they were great uh, great tools and, and great efforts, they, they just simply didn't have the provider input and the provider support to make them successful with consumers at large. So um, flash forward to now, and I can, I can share one instance which is, is kind of interesting, um, but we were able to work with the state of Wyoming in 2014, and there'll be a, a, actually a peer-reviewed paper coming out shortly um, from the folks that we work with there. We were able to, um, to work with the pregnant women um, with a focus on Medicaid there to, to experiment with this somewhat. And what we found was, um, you know, in the state of Wyoming, there are about 3,000 births a year. We, we were able to capture about 2,000 using our mobile solution. So we had a pretty high degree of patients actually engaged in our app. And one of the ways we got there was to make sure that their, um, their providers were either giving them a you know, prescription or referring them to the app. Once they referred them to the app, which they influenced and they customized and had their contact information in it, once, once they referred the patients to that app, the patients were engaged. The patients used it. The patients came back to it six to ten, ten times a, a month. So we were, we were seeing extremely high engagement levels. Now, that has actually resulted in some pretty, uh, pretty interesting uh, outcomes as well. So one of the um, examples I can give you is there, there's 22% um, higher uh, enrollment in prenatal care, early prenatal care for those mothers. We saw a pretty, um, pretty good drop in NICU admissions. I think it was 15 or 16%. I can't remember the exact number. But we definitely made an impact on those users. And the reason we did is because we partnered with the providers. And we, we were providing the information and the contacts and the resources that they wanted us to provide. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you're talking about that kind of brokered endorsement. I call it curation when it's education online. But the brokered, I mean, of anything, being a, being a physician in the public and a physician who uses media, it's really clear to me. People don't want a celebrity doctor giving them advice. They want to know what their own doctor, remember that love affair, the one that they take their clothes off or they take their kids' clothes off and they put a gown on and they wait for and they're they're brave enough to share their body and their vulnerabilities and their mind and their worries with this individual. And what you're saying is 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 I like the I think it's the best thing that we've said here today is that it's it's that finesse. It's valuing the love affair that exists there, but make helping the provider do a better job tracking the outcomes, but engaging them to say, what do you want in the app and how do you want it to help you in the day? And if I listen to you and iterate around your ideas, you'll then hand it to the patient's family, which is every startup's dream that a doctor is going to hand something over. But if it's helping them, and then all of a sudden, it's like, my doctor told me to do this. I mean, I think about how my mom, it's like she, she's so, so paternalistic about everything. It's like, the doctor said to do this, what do you think? Um, and, or not even, what do you think? The doctor told me to do this, and she forgets I went to medical school, right? So, but the... Um, that's so key that that's the curation part. And that's where the going to population-managed care and going to value-based care, if 
the doctors are included in the solutions. If it's not just start up here and start up there and person standing on an island trying to grab whatever they can to make the best possible, if it's really that, if it's really like we were talking about Zelf, the company in town, which is just such an elegant solution that says they're going to integrate in the opportunity in an electronic health record for like me in clinic to say, okay, I'm ordering physical therapy for you, but I'm also ordering um, the seven minute workout. And I want you to do the seven minute workout because I want to boost your self esteem about that you are exercising. You only have to do it seven minutes a day and come back to me in two months. And Zelf says, okay, I order it and maybe I have a drop down for my department that I've created for kids who are overweight and want to feel better or self esteem building or whatever it is. And I put in the seven minute workout, which is that freebie thing that came out because the New York Times wrote a dumpy little article, but it's awesome. Seven minutes, you should try it. When you feel really bad in a hotel room, it like makes you feel a lot better. So, what? Oh, she does. <laughs> Thank you. We're going to do that tonight. So let's say I order that. It pushes out through the patient portal based on the ethos and structure that the organization believes in. Patients look at it. And then the genius part of Zelf is that it then comes back to the provider and it says, this person looked at the seven-minute workout. And the doctor then has an idea that I ordered it and I'm satisfied that you did what I asked you to do. We have a partnership here. You tried it. Even if you hated it, you never do it again. At least you took my advice. And now our, my love, the love affair is going in two different directions. But it also made it easy for me because it's in my electronic health record. And also value that the patient could just get it through the portal. And they didn't have to go to another place, right? Because that's hard to do to get someone to download 13 different apps to do the 13 different things they want to do in their medical home. Um, but but that hand, that brokering, that how are we, you know, it's like um, I, I do a lot of work with the American Academy of Pediatrics and people are, out, people outside people are kind of coming in as me as a spokesperson to work for them to kind of come into the academy and get the academy to endorse. And the academy doesn't endorse anybody. But, ev but the academy has the ear of all the pediatricians and can get in the exam room with pediatricians. They can kind of tell pediatricians what they're supposed to say. They, we don't all do it. But they're the ones who decide what we're kind of supposed to say. And everybody wants to get into that exam room to get out at scale, right? And I think... Um, how are we going to do that? And you were asking about, like, how do doctors know about all that? Where have we incentivized doctors to learn about the best apps? Where have we incentivized doctors to know the best websites to send people to? They're just in Google, too, right? So they're just, they're beholden on the filter bubble that they live in, and they're also beholden on search engine optimization, which big players like Mayo Clinic do an amazing job at. Mm -hmm. You know, so um, it, it will be over time that, Hopefully, people like me in health systems will get some of these outside solutions in, serve them up, and expose clinicians and care teams to those ideas, and then make it easy for those care teams to deliver them directly to patients and families. And they're going to need help doing that. So let's, let's take that theme a little bit further. What advice would you give to innovators who want to innovate in this space? Because uh, I can hear a theme where, you know, recognize what's really going on with patients and do an innovation that helps patients. I can hear a theme like Zelf or something. Look what's going on, where the frustration points are for providers, and go there. I, I can hear friction all over the system. So do something that reduces friction. I can hear lots of pressure to move toward value. Do something that helps the system. If you did any. What, what's your sense? Are you, you got any, any nuggets for a community of innovators? What do you think they should do? Um, well, I, could, I can say one, one of the things that we've seen and certainly heard a demand for is, and I may have mentioned a little bit early, is as you're thinking about this space, I think it's important that when, when the patient starts this journey with you, you know, we're talking about trust and relationship building. And that's definitely what, what we're trying to do, too, is create those loyal relationships, create that trust so that the patient is taking your, you, your advice. And of course, we're reporting back just like you described. So our, you know, our health plans are getting member level data. Our hospitals are getting data of everyone who downloads and what they're, what they're looking at uh, and so forth. And our employers are getting employee level data so they can take action if someone's in trouble. If someone asks a question during their pregnancy that indicates they need help, they can take action to do that. Um, but, uh, I forgot where I was going, and it was a really good point, Lee. <laughs> oh, <laughs> innovate, innovate. Um, so I was just going to say, you know, from an, from an innovation perspective, we've also seen a trend toward, you know, as you mentioned too, con the concierge level care, kind of guiding the journeys. So you know, guiding a journey through pregnancy or oncology or whatever uh, state, and that can be with people or that can be with technology or what have you. But I think the one thing that we're learning is there's, you know, once you embark down that path 
um, it, there, there shouldn't be an endpoint. You should continue to help that consumer or that patient, or however that care transformation has happened, you should continue to be there um, dur during that journey. But also at the same time, um, you know, we can't, we can't boil the ocean. We can't solve every, uh, we can't solve diabetes and behavioral health and all these things at the same time, but we do have to pick the high impact things to address and the things where we feel like our expertise can really lend itself to providing a solution and go down that path. But at the same time, we have to stay there for people. Once we create these relationships, we have to keep those things going. Well, I think um, as you innovate, my hope would be that you're thinking about whatever you're doing and why. I mean, I, I feel like in the entrepreneurial space a lot, when, when you meet founders and, and those with these ideas, they come about it typically from like a personal story. Like they've seen something happen in their family or to themselves, and then that gets them motivated to solve the problem because of the anguish that they experienced. But my hope would be continuing to think as you evolve it, because you know, to your point, like by the time it's mature, eight to 10 years from now, the system's gonna be totally different, the payment's gonna be totally different, the incentives are gonna be aligned or maligned in different ways. And so it's thinking on, also, how are you, as best you can, getting to the provider, I mean, as like the voice of providers right now, asking them what work you can do for them. <laughs> like, what box can you check that makes their life kind of miserable? What takes them away from their purpose and their passion? And when you figure that out and build that in where it's of value to your end user, which is typically the patient family probably, if you're building for consumers or patients, um, that you're really fastidiously keeping something on the whiteboard that says this is gonna check this box for the health, for the system or the doctor. But if you're checking a box for the doctor or the nurse practitioner or the MA, that's a big deal. I mean, and keeping that as some part of your true north will, I think, keep you in the system, <laughs> keep you possible, and kind of feed and grow and fertilize the opportunity that amid the changes of ACA repeal <laughs> that didn't happen, or the changes of, of payment reform that'll come, um, and the population management value-based care, that you'll, the, the, the physician experience, sorry, or provider experience will continue to be um, equally import important for sustaining models um, in that like, if we're gonna design something that echoes solving for us in our kitchens at low cost, hopefully, that maybe a system is paying for because it it's expeditious, you still have to let the doctors know all the work you did for them. You're gonna have to remind them. Like, you want, it's like you want me, if, if, if we deployed 100 Amazon, I mean, well, that's a good idea, if we deployed 100 dots to 100 families that after three months, I'd love to know what they didn't do or how many pings they did so that I was reminded how few, much fewer nursing calls my nurses got and how much more than uh, underburdened they felt and what the cost of that really was. So I don't know, that was just a, a thought on that. And I think um, you just have to be so brave People are just gonna say no, and they're gonna say no, and they're not gonna move the money the right way, and the hospital that you ask isn't gonna work. You're just gonna have to keep being brave and bold. Because of anything, and we were talking about that a little bit before, I'm so stinking tired of like the lack of bravery and the like excuses and the waiting. It's like you just can't wait anymore. Well, but it still takes a lot of persistence. I agree, it? it's exhausting, but it, but it. Well, speaking of uh, exhausted, we've got, an, oh, uh, you're still awake. Let's, let's give you a chance to ask some questions out there. Do we uh, have a handheld that we can pass around, David? Okay. Yeah, uh, and that, if you can give me an opportunity to come and give you the mic, that way the people on the live stream will be able to hear you. Yeah, that would be very helpful. Right there, the man in white. Hi, so um, I want to preface this by saying that my wife works for the Alexa team just up the road, and uh, I've been texting her this whole time about how much you've been talking about it. She's absolutely loving it. Um, yeah, a couple of people reached out for me today, and I said, you should come to this panel, because I might mention it. Little did I know I was going to spend half the time talking about it. Sorry. But um, I am curious about a huge elephant in the room that never really seemed to come up, and that's the, the issue of privacy. So. Um, if everybody's already forgotten, last week our uh, federal government loosened the restrictions on privacy for internet data, and um, uh, I'm sure if I say the word HIPAA, there's a bunch of people that are probably grabbing their chest and feeling a lot of anxiety, um, and, I, and me personally coming from the legal community, I, c I can say that HIPAA is only the beginning and that, that we are going to eventually move to much tighter restrictions on privacy. Um, 
And so I, I'm, I'm hoping if you could just kind of just discuss that or, or give you know, your opinions, both Dr. Swanson and uh, Ms. Phelps. Um, and I, I also want to point out a really um, a good example. I have a friend down in California who is working with Google, and uh, they are using Google Analytics to predict um, the, um, the, sorry, I'm totally lost my train of thought there, uh, their, uh, epidemics. And uh, their initial results are alarmingly accurate, precise, and um, in real time. They can predict flu, they can predict all sorts of diseases, um, and it's really both incredible but also very scary just knowing how much data is truly out there. I'll, I'll talk and I'd love to hear your thoughts. So, and I, I, I am not an, I mean, I have a degree in bioethics and I know still very little about HIPAA. Um, so flu trends has been going on for years. So Google's been doing that for years. Just basically, basically that was built off how many people were searching about symptoms that related and were typical of influenza itself, and then predicting models of where influenza was coming, based in, two, in addition, knowing global data of how influenza moves across the globe, which typically does move in a pattern, typically through seasons. But I think with great accuracy that people are doing that based on, as we know, I mean, I get, I get in my car now, and, it, and, and Google will tell me, like, 16 minutes to home, and I'm like, ew. Like, how do you know where I'm going, right? Or 23 minutes to clinic, because it's Tuesday, and they know I'm driving up there. So um, it's creepy and eepy and, like, slimy and weird, and yet kind of helpful. I'm like, sweet, I'm not going to be late. This is um, like Lake, Lake Wab Wo excuse me, like Lake Wobegon, where you never use your turn signals because everybody knows every, where you're going, going anywhere. Yeah. Thank you. I'm a Minnesotan, so thank you for that. Yeah. Um, Former Minnesota, a recovering and happy Minnesotan. Uh, so, so I think um, a, a couple, a couple of things about that. I think we all live on a spectrum of what we're comfortable with with privacy. I mean, I, you can use a simple example of like me as a very public physician. I'll go talk to physicians, and people are like, "I'm not going to share anything about my life in the public." To people like me who tell stories about their family and, and basically do that in the arms of, of public health. To, gosh, do I want Alexa to be listening to me when I'm asking? about my kid's constipation and some hacker coming in and then knowing my kid's constipating and then someone learning about it and then him, someone making fun of him on the playground and ruining him, right? I mean, I'm being silly, but um, it's scary, particularly in a time right now where, you know, um, coverage for pre-existing conditions may not, you know, <laughs> may not persist, right? That if we are judged on our pre-existing conditions or really scarily, right? What if we're judged on our genome? Right? What if we're what if we're excluded from certain health plans or reform based on our 23andMe profile that somebody pops into or something that I shared, et cetera? So, um, I think the spectrum is really important, and I think the opt-in and the data around opt-in. Most people and research kit hopefully will continue by Apple to help us show that most people who participate in in studies or in um, in sharing information about their health want the information to be shared. They don't want to be victimized by it, but they typically want what they've done, given, shared, know, and have had experiences about to be shared to the world. And you can use that in the harm space too, that we know that people who have been harmed by a medical problem, procedure, or like any medical iatrogenic error, one of the number one things that people will always say is, I just want to make sure this doesn't happen to anyone else. Who can I talk to? How can I help? Who, what community can I reach out to to make sure that they don't know? That peer-to-peer -peer comes in, in a drive. So. You, we all need to think really carefully about how we protect patients and families, but we also need to think carefully about the barometer of allowing people to opt in in different ways. Some, and we don't do that. We just say, oh, it's all HIPAA or not. We just say, we're not gonna share anything. And then we make it impossible that my CT scan doesn't get to my surgeon because it was from one other place to another place, and, but I'm smart enough and my husband's a radiologist, so I put it on a drive and I brought it, and someone like Connie would have hopefully preempted that. But the, but we make it, we, it's, it's black or white. We never say, are you okay? I mean, we, we sign paperwork and we do all that, but the systems aren't developed based on kind of who you are. And like who you are on a privacy standpoint, like today, might be really different than you are 10 years from now, et cetera. So I think as we build solutions, we need to arm up and lawyer up so we understand how we're fiercely protecting patient and family privacy. But I also think we should let people bring, be able to bring the curtains down when they want to. And we don't do that. Um, well, I'll just add that, you know, I think it, it is, it's a great question because it's certainly something that we wake up every morning thinking about from, you know, from our perspective at Wildflower. And, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, we, we started out the hard way. We started out working with health plans. So we, we were scrutinized and, and you know, our, our standards are extremely high for privacy and we obviously have a HIPAA compliant platform. But um, you're right, we have to share certain data in order, in order for a person to get a, a personalized 
experience, we have to know some data. So we try to be thoughtful about what we ask and thoughtful about what we share within our app, like location services and things like that. So those conversations are still happening and they're, they're essentially client driven. If our client really wants us to enable those, those things, um, obviously we can do that, but we're trying to be very careful about how we approach that. But, um, but I, I, I think, again, you know, we went through the hard part first <laughs> by dealing with the health plans first and the scrutiny and, and, and the security, but I feel like we're, we're in good shape. Now we just have to be very careful about how we, how we pull those triggers. And I think I kind of avoided your question. I mean, I, I, just to be honest, I mean, I think it's super hard and super dangerous, and yet most people, to get healthier or better, will risk it. Oh, okay, well, I, I can do it. But I do think most people will risk it. Like, this guy John Wilbanks is worth following on Twitter who thinks and fights and st studies all this stuff all the time. But I, I love following his feed because it's, it's really very much about like patient like protection, but also that people really, once they give their data or their tissue or their organ or their lab studies, like most people are pretty comfortable sharing it. Great question, thank you. Another question? Thank you. Uh, David Norris uh, with Precision Methodologies, a scientific and statistical consultancy. So, uh, Dr. Swanson, you described very eloquently the uh, predicament of the providers who are sort of uh, being eaten by this uh, fire breathing dragon of billing and EHR. Um, and uh, also the, the, uh, the courage of uh, patients. Uh, and, and the need for courage on the other side. There are a lot of doctors who are, well, uh, uh, many doctors have um, uh, sort of slain that dragon uh, with this concept of direct primary care. And I wonder, has, it, has that concept made any inroads in pediatrics? And what do you think, and, and, and uh, Connie, if, if you're familiar with this as well, what do you think that uh, tells us about the, the heading of the talk today, uh, the, the patient as consumer? Um, and, uh, Will you and define direct primary care so I know exactly what you're talking oh, about? Oh, yeah, sure. So I, I thought um, it might be more, uh, more well known. So uh, physicians will uh, decide to uh, abandon billing. Uh, the, often this enables them to abandon uh, the EHR, and became, which is, as we know, a billing machine, right? Uh, and uh, uh, serves those prerogatives first and not the prerogatives either of the, the patient or of the physician. Uh, and and re to receive direct payments from patients, you know, th and there, there would be the connection with uh, the concept of patient as consumer. Uh, so I, I, I gather it's not made very. Uh, no, no, great no, no, yeah. I just needed you to define care. it. So, yeah. th I mean, I look at those in those con kind of concierge. I kind of bucket those in concierge models. I mean, in the just getting rid of the pain, and saying I'm just going to be at your beck and call. So, a, a colleague of mine runs a a a, a, um, a group in sa the San Francisco area and in Hollywood to very very wealthy individuals where and literally part of their premise is like the phone will never go unanswered. 24-7, you, the doctor's phone will never go, your doctor will always answer. It doesn't matter if he's hiking in the Sierras or if he's at dinner with his family, he's never gonna let a phone go unanswered. Which actually, again, I think is the illusion that that's better healthcare. I don't think you need to have your doctor on speed dial. I just don't think you usually need that. But, so that's there, that's, that, that's in a, that th both covers, and then there's like a group called One Medical which has kind of tried to do that as well, brick and mortar plus technology plus kind of throwing it out the door and then all these other concierge models. And um, I like them because to your, your word, um, it is courageous by all sorts of people to just get rid of the gruff, but it's not, it's not gonna work for the population. <laughs> the poor people, the uneducated, those without jobs, those without resources, those most vulnerable Right? The, all the kids that are hungry today in the United States, depends on the day, but one in, um, you know, sometimes 20% of children are hungry on a typical day. Um, so who, who, those models will, I mean, those models in the, are like the Marines, right? They are gonna plow some of it forward. They're gonna make space for it. But our obligation here is to figure out how to involve the people who pay, the employer-based currently models in my mind, because I like supporting these other models because they teach us and we learn from them, but um, we, we just won't serve who, the, the most vulnerable, the ones who are suffering the very most, those who are poor and those who don't have access and the social determinants of their lives and health are bad. And, um, you know, the age, you know, 
um, lifespan is decreasing for Caucasian Americans right now because of three mental health challenges primarily. Fatty liver disease, second to alcoholism, suicide, and drug overdoses. People are unhappy, they're reaching to chemicals, and we're not living as long anymore, which is pretty grim. First time that our life expectancy is going down, not up. It's actually going up for African Americans and Latinos, and it's going down for Caucasians right now, but anyway. Okay, one, do we, do last we have one last question. One last question from the internet. Is that okay? Oh, perfect. Okay, this is uh, from someone viewing online. Uh, for Dr. Swanson, as both a mother and a doctor, is there any area or transaction of healthcare that you would not like to see digitized or consumerized, or is it all fair game? Uh, someone online. <laughs> you won't even tell me totally anonymous. So I'm sorry, I got a bit distracted because I'm like, I can only do one thing at once, which is true of the brain. But the so it was just basically what shouldn't be digitized. Yeah, is there any area or transaction in healthcare that you would not like to see digitized? Yeah, um, the first thing that comes to mind is that initial newborn baby visit. Why in the world would we ever digitize that? Why would you not want a new baby to be received by a healthcare provider who's learned how to look for, screen for, think on, and predict ways to keep that baby alive as long as possible? Um, we should always offer hand, I mean, I, I, love, I love Abraham Verghese, who's a physician at Stanford, wrote Cutting for Stone, but one of his things is he termed, he had this term, it was like in Time Magazine, I don't know, a few years ago, we called it like the eye patient. You know, everything was digitized, and he's, he's like the old voice of physical exam. Right, there's just sometimes something that you can't replace, which is I just need this doctor to look at this rash and tell me that it looks okay. And I may do that through an app, but I might want a human being in the room to just, with their entire body, reassure me. Of anything I've been learning in my life um, the last few years is that digital channels are thready and thin. They will never replace the human endeavors that occur when a human, when I come to Connie with a problem where I'm worried and I'm not sleeping about it or I really care about it, about on behalf of a loved one or myself, and she looks at me and she shows me that she's listening, she demonstrates empathy, integrity, and honesty, and then she renders an opinion based on her expertise. How in the world are we gonna digitize all of medicine? We're just not. And, and when people always worry that everyone's gonna call Dr. Google an emergency, it's obviously very clear. In an emergency, people call people human beings for help, which is why every doctor has job security. It's not like doctors are gonna go away. Like people worry that this is all, or nurses, they have job security. What nurses do at bedside to educate and heal and support and cure, like that's not gonna go away. So I, I, I think actually the hands-on matters and physical exam matters at particular times of worry and anxiety, and I would suggest birth and maybe even when somebody wants someone, in a medical profession present at death. But, but there's all the other things that human beings will so efficiently surpass in person sometimes, what you could maybe do in four video visits that leave somebody kind of biting their lip. So um, I believe that we will digitize redundancy and waste and we will make space for that, the, the kind of intimate bond when human beings reach out for help. And if Watson can wheel into the room and help me do a much better job at creating a differential diagnosis, so when I see the rash and I say, oh, it's just scabies and it's actually, um, I don't know, something that I don't even know, and actually uh, uh, Watson tells me that, hallelujah. Because I think the patient still wants me to tell them about whatever it is um, and that and may not be wrong that it's scabies because of my, my bad training or my, my misinformation or my not asking the right questions. So that's my answer to the anonymous online individual. <laughs> Thank you very much. I don't believe in physicians being online anonymously either, sorry. I don't, but patients can. There's a lot of room uh, for digital augmentation of, of healthcare. Uh, our track record so far isn't that great, right? Mm -hmm. uh, EHR, I mean, that must stand for something besides electronic health record. Uh, I'm sure there's a nasty, really bad uh, right, right, something like that. But, uh, you know, your question uh, reminded me of the day, the well, very long day I spent in the emergency department with every expert from every specialty trying to understand my wife's symptoms 
and in the end they couldn't explain it all and they were about to send their home when the grizzled old veteran primary care doc said, you know, I'm just not comfortable with this. We need to do a CT scan. And there it was, bigger than an egg, a meningioma. You know, nobody came up with that until he finally, he, he, so there's a, there's a role here. I think there's a lot of potential for augmentation, both in friction reduction, uh, you know, Watson at your side to, uh, although actually uh, there's people in the audience who have a better alternative to Watson, but. <laughs> um, you should tell me that name so I can plug that more instead of always saying Watson, sorry, right, with decision well, support. Yeah. That man in black back there, <laughs> okay, okay, he, right. he, he'll tell you about it over a glass of wine. So, um, but there's, there's real work to be done. On the other hand, there's so many ways to stumble. I mean, one of the takeaways I have from this conversation is <coughs> if you've got an innovation idea, take the time to talk redundantly to many people at the front lines of healthcare and find out the realities so that you are really not uh, basing your innovation on assumptions that will prove faulty in the, in the end, because we do that. We simplify uh, and we make mistakes, but there's important work to be done here. Thank you all very much. Let me invite you now to enjoy our networking time and engage with our wonderful speakers. Please join me in thanking them.